Hello and welcome to Grief Tending. This is a podcast series that's aimed at supporting anyone who's in a caregiving role to someone who's grieving. It may be that you're a community member, family, friend or neighbor who is looking to support someone who is living with grief, um, whether in illness or in bereavement. It may be that you are a paid caregiver or healthcare professional or someone working in another area who's looking to expand and develop your own um, grief tending skills. These conversations are seeking to cultivate our collective capacities to be alongside grief in supportive ways. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on whose unceded land these interviews are recorded, Turrbal and Yagara peoples, to acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture, and to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect and welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners. This episode is entitled On the Artist's Grief Deck, a creative toolkit for grieving, healing and self-compassion. And our guest for this episode, which sits in the community stream, is Adrian Yannick. Uh, Adrian is an artist, educator, scholar, activist and end-of-life doula who resides in the desert. In her work, she develops and shares creative processes that support personal introspection, social critique, community building, and cultural transformation. Yannick's current creative research projects include data humanization performances, immersive learning experiments, and public performances of reading Climate Futures with her Eco Tarot deck. Yannick serves as the creative producer of Turn It Around, a global arts and climate education project. Um, Yannick received a BA in English from Douglas College, uh, Rutgers University, a Master of Fine Arts in Electronic Arts um, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and a Sacred Passage End of, De- End of Life Doula Certification from the Con- Conscious Dying Institute. At Arizona State University, Yannick serves as the Professor of Expanded Arts in the School of Art and is the Senior Global Futures Scientist at the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, which is currently pursuing a PhD in sustainability. Responding to the devastating loss of the COVID-19 outbreak, Yannick initiated the Artist's Grief Deck, a crowdsourced toolkit for moving with and through grief. This printed deck and ongoing repository of artwork and prompts was produced in December 2020 by the Artists Literacies Institute in partnership with the US-based National Hospice Coalition. Since then, the decks have been distributed for free to community-based grief resource spaces, translated into Spanish, and expanded to include another collection, the Children and Youth Artists Grief Deck, which has been, uh, and the main deck has been republished um, by Princeton Architectural Press. So in this conversation, Uh, this episode on the artist's grief deck, a creative toolkit for grieving, healing, and self-compassion. It it really speaks to the the heart of what we were hoping and aiming to do with this series, which is to provide practical ways for people who are supporting anyone who is grieving um, to tend to that grief, to to move with it, to help people move through it. Um, So we explored the creation of the artist's grief deck Um, the crowdsourced nature of it, and also the ways in which it speaks to different layers and diversities of uh, people's grief experience. You know, we can think of it, uh, I've been thinking of it almost as like an expanded filing cabinet of the different individual and aspects of grief that an individual might feel, as well as this collective gathering of the very different ways that different people experience grief at different times. It's so often said, you know, grief is unique and there's no right or wrong way to grieve. So you imagine this this deck of 60 cards for any individual, never mind there being five stages and they're always being in the same order. Imagine taking that deck and reshuffling the 60 cards for each person that you were supporting in grief. It could be that they're the way in which they experience, while, while, you know, while there's similarities to some themes and some some aspects of grief, the way in which we experience them, the order, the intensity, um, and how they show up is is so different for different people. So 
you know, if, if at all possible while you're listening to this episode, um, if you don't already have a copy of the deck, you can order one. But you can also jump online because this is a, there's a, a, another layer to this, um, to the grief deck. It's also an online repository, um, which means that in addition to the, in addition to the sixty printed um, cards in the in the I was going to say real version <laughs> in the printed version, um, it's also uh, an open sourced. Uh, uh, you know, online repository. So there's a submission portal there where they welcome um, additions to the online version from anyone, uh, whoever you are. Um, so you, you're, you're able to actually contribute as well. So while you're listening to the episode, you might want to pull up. Um, there's beautiful visual scanned um, versions of the cards as well as the prompts that accompany them. Um, and uh, um, we, we will see some examples. We kind of go into detail on two or three uh, different cards during the conversation and th- they'll be up on the screen as well um, I really appreciate it we focused mostly on the, on the deck during the conversation but also spoke Adrian also shared in you know her work as an end of life doula and community death care supporter the ways in which there's such tender and gentle skills we can cultivate we particularly spoke about listening and witnessing and how important these two things are in being alongside people who are grieving, whether that is through an illness um, and living with, you know, recent diagnosis throughout an experience of palliative care, or whether it's someone who is bereaved, you know, family or community member has died. These, These acts, these qualities of listening and witnessing sound so simple, just to say the words. But, you know, I was wondering if you have ever had an experience of not feeling listened to, of not feeling heard, and not feeling seen, then you will appreciate that those qualities don't just show up without intention or without, um, well, without intention. And so they are things which it's possible for any of us, whether we are in professional or paid roles, or whether as a friend or family member, these are things we can uh, seek to put in place, to develop and to, to cultivate within ourselves. I really liked how Adrian just highlighted, you know, some of us have just been practicing those things longer than others and that we can every day continue our practice. Um, so I really hope whoever you are, whatever your context, you might consider um, through the process of listening, listening to this, maybe getting a grief deck, maybe not just getting one for yourself, but maybe there's somewhere, somewhere that you're connected to in your community. Do you think, you know, maybe a school that you might be connected to, someone in your family or community might be able to make use of this. You might be connected to a community group that would find this useful. You might be working in healthcare. Perhaps this could be something that you you seek to to bring in there. Um, although. The COVID-19 pandemic was the instigation um, behind the um, the deck coming into being. Um, It's in no way specific to that and really does speak to a diversity of different experiences of grief in life. And um, yeah, I really um, hope there's something in this conversation that that connects and resonates for you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Hi, Adrian. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. It's great to be here, Alan. I'm really looking forward to our conversation about your work and the, the grief deck and wherever else we may we may go today. Um, so I, I wanted to start, I suppose, I think your, your role in, in as creative producer and curator of the deck seems quite connected to your own work and background and experience. So I wanted to invite you first um, to share a bit um, in terms of context about your your own practice and your work and both academically and, and otherwise. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for asking. So, so I'm an artist, uh, first and foremost, and I'm also an educator. I'm a scholar activist and also I serve my community as an end of life uh, doula. And what that is, uh, for anyone that doesn't understand, is it's someone that assists with supporting all aspects of death, 
uh, that aren't medical. <laughs> so anything that's not medical, uh, we come in and can support a family, an individual, uh, the person, most often the person that's dying. And there's many aspects to the work that uh, we're not going to speak more deeply about now. Mm. But um, my own art practice uh, has been since I was a child. But my professional uh, development of that art practice is what we call expanded arts. So it's I jump around across uh, various mediums. And basically, I create systems that support people on, uh, in personal introspe introspection, uh, community building, um, also in uh, cultural transformation mm -hmm. and social critique. So the systems might be digital, they might be in person. Uh, I currently have a practice where I go out into public in the street and I offer people climate future readings with an eco tarot deck that I made. So I created this creative system and it enables this performance, this exchange to happen. Mm. Uh, so that's the kind of work that I do. Mm. And so the grief deck is a system to support uh, people that are moving through and with grief. Mm. Yeah, and and so as we move to talk about that resource that I think came into the world in 2022. Um, 2020. 2020, ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to inquire about your, the process, I suppose, there's a few layers to it. So could you talk to us around how the project initially came about and your role within it? Um, sure. So it was completely... Uh, instigated or emerged out of the horrible devastation of the beginning months of COVID. Um, uh, in New York City in particular, it was extremely hard hit. People rem might rem in Queensland might remember um, seeing it in the news. Uh, and uh, an organization, a nonprofit or uh, umbrella organization that's called um, Volunteer Organizations Aiding with Disasters, uh, is an umbrella of nonprofit groups that usually go in after a hurricane, after a tornado, after an earthquake, and assist communities after the immediate emergency with, with rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And so this um, VOAD group in New York City, uh, they had identified an unmet need of being supporting grieving and collective grieving that there was so many, if you remember in the first months, there was like 20,000 people that were dying I know my own friends that were in New York City were quite traumatized by all the sirens. And of course, you know, it was so much fear at that time. People were quite dense in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked by um, my colleague who runs the Artist Literacies Institute if I would come together with other artists and with BOAD, with this group, um, to do an artist's working group on grief. The Artist Literacies Institute there. Um, purpose is they understand that artists do a lot more than paint and draw. Um, they've seen the way that artists are troubleshooters, are synthesizers, are instigators, are, and they have a strong feeling that artists are not being leveraged as much as they can be in the culture, especially when dealing with uh, challenging problems. And so they brought together this artist working group. We met Every other week, it had faith leaders in it um, from New York City VOAD, headed the Salvation Army in New York City. Um, many, many different people were there. And then there was a small group of artists that were also there. And we were listening to what the needs were and what the perceived um, you know, idea of these unmet needs. Mm -hmm. And I started just gestated this idea of a grief toolkit and again, this is a time when people couldn't access their normal grieving communities. Mm -hmm. They couldn't access even their families, their extended families. They couldn't get hugs, you know. Um, all the ways that we normally process grief, and of course, were often traumatized because they weren't able to be with their loved ones as they died, as you might normally be. Mm -hmm. And so um, the idea was to, for, that, I, that I offered was a, a kind of grief toolkit and the uniqueness of it um, was that it would be crowdsourced, that it wouldn't just be from one person who was all knowing about grief, but that collective knowledge existed from people that had been processing grief and working with grief, uh, not just as experts, but as you know, normal people that had 
moved through and with it in their own lives. And then I knew that there were many artists that were also engaging with this as a topic. Artists deal with my art, life and death a lot in our work um, and had been touching grief. And so, um, so I pitched this idea. Uh, the group liked it. Uh, we were able to um, crowd fund, crowdsource the funding and also came up with an angel partner in the National Hospice Coalition who had already been thinking of some way to support people and their palliative care workers also to assist people with grief. And so they came on board and became a really incredible partner. And I pitched the project in July. Uh, the call went out in September. The call ended in October. And by December 2020, we had printed grief decks in people's hands. Wow, what a turnaround. Yeah, it was a really, it was wild. But it was, uh, so that was the first printing. The first printing went primarily to um, organizations, to grief workers, to but also they were available to families. And so they went out for free, quite a few of them. Yeah. Um, and then we had a small portion that were left over that we started to sell. We sold enough uh, just immediately uh, that it sold out and we did a second printing and then that sold out. Um, and uh, because obviously there's a need and then thankfully Princeton Architectural Press came on seeing that this they really enjoyed the project and so they reissued it in 2022 which is i think what you're right. referring to how you got the 2022 cents so that was actually the new edition and now that has sold out yeah wow. it's initial printing and it's um going into its second printing just or just the second printing was just completed yeah huh. yeah yeah so i'm not sure at which of those thresholds you would have considered the project a success but um it, it seems no question about that having met exactly like you say an unmet such an unmet need. Well, what's really been beautiful to me, and this happens often as an artist, is you have an idea, you offer it up, but you don't always know everything about how it's going to work or what it's going to be like or what it's going to serve. It's there's a it's a a gift that's part of what I hone as an artist is how to listen to what needs to move through me. And then I made that offering. And what's been beautiful is the crowdsourcing piece where the, each card is from a totally different person, from a different background, mm. different experience, totally different approach, and all the different voices mm. you know, that, that exist within it. And to me, that's been really a special thing about it as an offering within this grief support space. And then the other thing, which I didn't quite realize, maybe just instinctually, is the form factor of the card. I know myself, when I've been through really deep grief, it has cognitive effects. It has physical effects, not just emotional. Hmm. And I I couldn't read a book, you know? And so the card, (laughs) the form factor of the, the card just seems perfect because sometimes that's really all you can take in. It's just this very, very small piece, if that, you know, really. So those things are more things that I, you know, maybe I could have read a lot of research papers or, you know, whatever, but I stumbled upon them intuitively. And and, um, so, yeah, so I think just, you know, to me, the fact that people like yourself, uh, you know, reach back out and say how much that it's meant to them and supported them and, you know, that the decks get passed on, which is another like really beautiful thing where people are, mm. you know, offering it to their friends that can use it. I think um, that's all like a real marker of the success. Yeah. And for us to have come across this, you know, on the on the other side of the world um, and, and right. be able to speak about it, you know, it feels like this very, I don't know, mycelial kind of spreading of of the of the um, the thing that was seeded, you know, like you say, in the middle of the pandemic when there was so much so much suffering and changed i think the the landscape of of not only death but grief for you know the whole world um so it seems to have emerged in such a contemporary context you know and but it, it's so fascinating to me that what emerged from that process that you've described was not another grief textbook and not you know another um academic or or psychologically facing um project but one that had creativity and art and beauty at its core 
explore it seeking to engage and explore very much with the the roar and the the difficulty of um of grief but this yeah as i was mentioning before we we um got online like there's such beauty in this in this deck and um i was talking with we have a wonderful art therapist here at the hospice mm. and um she's she's been using this with in an art therapy group with bereaved mm. parents and that's so um, fantastic to hear yeah and and i think just being struck by the way in which a piece of art or a prompt that someone has created completely on the other side of the world without knowing anything about you know somebody else can can connect and resonate mm. people would say a similar thing about music you know it's its ability to transcend many other um real or imagined barriers um mm. you know um yeah i just wanted to say one other thing yeah. i don't want to interrupt your frame of thought but just to mention that it's of course we have the printed decks but it's also was conceived as an open repository online yes. So all the cards that are printed in the deck are online, but there's also many, many more that, and you yourself, if you're listening and you've made work, um, visual artwork, or might have a prompt or something to offer, you can actually um, submit it and it'll be put up um, you know, on the site. So it's an open repository. So it can really move through and with and the dynamic of you know what, what's happening. And also again, from those other cultural perspectives that may not be in the in just the 60 cards um, that were printed. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a, a great point that I think it will continue to evolve and grow and be expressed in, in dynamic ways through that. And yeah, we certainly direct people and link people to the, the website for the work. And it's uh, it again presented in such a beautiful way that it's easy to to engage and, and interact with, um, with the pieces. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for highlighting that. Um, I wanted to ask, and this question actually came from Judy, our art therapist, around curiosity around the relationship between the prompts and the artworks and mm. whether the artworks were in some sense commissioned or specific to this or whether they seem to synthesize thematically having mm. been created before, something like this. Yeah, thank you. The The process that we um, had, we got, we did this call, we got many, many hundreds of entries, mm -hmm. and um, we called through them, um, looking at them very closely, um, really working with the imagery in a way um, first, uh, and looking at and, and seeing um, different types of imagery, uh, different uh, tones and moods. Uh, um, yeah, just really trying to get a, a, or, you know, really reflect a diversity. There was already a diversity in what had been um, uh, submitted. And then we started to work with the prompts. Now, many of the um, artworks, people did also submit a prompt along with them. So there's like maybe, I don't know, maybe four, 40, maybe 50% or so, the artist had uh, also offered a prompt. And so uh, many times, we, most of the time, we included those. But if the artwork seemed stronger or it seemed redundant, we didn't want a lot of redundancy, um, we would maybe swap that out. And we had other people that had um, put in um, just prompts, so sent in poems or other instructions. And then um, if there was something um, that was a topic that we felt was really important that really wasn't covered in what had been submitted, that's where we went to a list of prompts that have been generated by our partners in the National Hospice Coalition. So for instance, there's one that's like speaking specifically about like the difference between grief and depression and kind of, you know, things to ask yourself about the difference with that. So thinking through you know, is this a normal process or something I maybe need to, you know, go, go see a professional about. Um, uh, there's, an, there's ones about also anxiety. There's, so there's a number of ones that they, that they had offered from their vast experience that, um, that seemed very important. And then the process of pairing them was actually quite beautiful. I mean, of course, if the artist had offered the prompt, those are, you know, very organic, how they existed together. But then 
we didn't want it to be a, like where the artwork was like illustrating it. It was more like that the artwork was there and then it had a, like a, uh, it evoked, you know, something that was in the family of what the prompt was. Um, so it was not like super matchy matchy. It definitely started with the artwork, all of it. Like we had curated the artwork that we wanted to have, and then we were matching them with the, with the prompts. Mm. Okay. So the artwork, all of the artworks were there and then the prompts sort of matched to those yeah. through that process yeah. you're describing. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I think for anyone who sees or, or has the chance to, to look through, I think the, the trying to find the term like the non-literal um linking the mm. non-explicit linking mm. sometimes i think is is um feels to have some expanse to it it's like an invitation but also an openness to be like ah oh, how might you sit with this that's um, right and i think yeah. you know sometimes especially for adults who've maybe been separated from the process of creativity so we might typically hear um, especially in grief, if people are encouraged or, you know, invited to take part in artistic, oh, I'm, I'm, what's the, I don't have a creative bone in my body is typically the, the thing people say. Um, yeah. th that there can be this pressure, especially with quote unquote modern art, you know, like I don't get it or I don't understand yeah. it or something. But the, what strikes me from these images is there's, there's an invitation for curiosity or maybe wonder um, mm. in them rather than, you know, do you get the link between the <laughs> this thing and the? Oh, yeah. good. I'm glad to hear that. That was definitely something that was important to us. And and just to say that, like, one of the ways that they can that they are being used is where people just look at the images and see what attracts them, and then they'll turn it over and see the prompt, and maybe then it becomes this like kind of a, a portal to get some instruction, you know, that you might not have thought that you needed or might not originally have thought like, oh, I don't want to do that or, you know, whatever. So there's something interesting about just also the, just the resonance, you know, with, or like what's calling to you in the, in the artwork, what it, you know, because there are so many different, I'm looking down at some cards I have spread out here, so many different moods and, and possibilities that exist within the deck, including, you know, many people think, you know, grief is just sadness, but of course it's, it's a, a panoply of emotions of very complex, you know, um, emotions at times that we don't even really even have names for, but certainly, you know, anger and frustration and, uh, you know, of course, sadness, but um, confusion and, um, and joy and joy also um, in, in the memories and in, in, in the loss, in the depth of feeling, you know, and that all can be very unsettling, you know, as well. And so there's, there's cards and prompts that assist people also in different stages really of grief, um, you know, when you are healing, but there's still these waves that, you know, come in. And so there's many different entrance points, uh, you know, into the deck as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. And speaking of entrance points, I wonder, I know you do have some some cards spread out there. I, um, yeah, I didn't want to, you, you may well have some favorites, but if you didn't, I didn't want to put that pressure of like pick some favorites. But I did wonder if, if maybe you wanted to talk around uh, a handful of, of the cards, the artworks, something like this to, yeah, to just give people a bit more insight to there just seems so much consideration in the curation and the intentionality so please Thank share you. With us some of that. yeah i'd love to do that um so yeah i have more than a handful here so i'm just kind of working it out so i'll just start um with this um uh photographic collage uh it's the artwork um is by mark uh igben um, and it's a, yeah, it's a photographic collage. And the prompt on it is one that's from the National Hospice Coalition. Uh, and it says, people grieve differently. Not everyone grieves alike. Some express grief through their feelings and gain comfort from talking to others. And others express grief through actions and problem solving, preferring not to talk about their grief. Both are normal ways of grieving. 
And then the prompts are how, some questions. How do you express your grief? Through feelings and words or actions and doing? And what do you find to be the most helpful to you in your grief? Who in your life may be grieving differently? And how do they show it? And I love this piece because there are so many different ways to grieve. And it is very complicated. And for instance, if you're in a family or a community where you've just lost someone, people might be grieving very differently and they can be at cross purposes. Mm. And so just taking that moment to reflect on, oh, maybe that thing that that person's doing or the way they're acting, like that may be connected to, to how they're grieving mm. and be so helpful and so healing. And so, um, and also just in that reflection as well, I think um, thinking about, you know, what, how do I express my grief? What's helpful to me in my grief, right? So that we can begin to like, just at least touch and begin to articulate that. So then maybe we can ask some people that aren't grieving around us to support us in our grief. So um, this is a wonderful um, artwork by um, someone named Blur. The front has some text, the text in the front that kind of crosses her out. You can see it's a person sleeping, says you are still worthy even if breathing is all you can do today. And the prompt is, a, it's just titled rest. And then it says, take a nap without guilt. Mm. Mm. So yeah. that gentleness, just that invitation for, because that can be something, oh, I need to do something to get through this. You know, obviously that can be a pull. So I love, you know, mm. this just inviting people to take a nap. Absolutely. Um, Here's a beautiful one that's um, kind of an illustration. Um, and I don't know if, do we have time for me to read all of them or would you like me to just summarize? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this one is called, um, the prompt is by Kate Campbell and the artwork is by Grace Howard and it's a print. Um, and the prompt is food, grief, and healing. And they submitted it together. So um, they submitted it as a partnership. And it says food, is a powerful coping mechanism for grief. We gather around tables for comforting meals or deliver casseroles to grieving loved ones. In grief, it's tempting to indulge in sugary, fatting foods for comfort. But instead, I've learned to channel my grief into cooking and turn it into something tangible. I start with raw materials which need to be chopped, cut open, smashed, or diced in order to release their potency and cook properly. When raw material meets heat, true transformation begins. And then there's a prompt for the reader. Choose a recipe, one you know by heart or one you've never tried. Gather the ingredients. As you manipulate each raw ingredient, project your grief into it. Watch it transform as you chop, slice, saute, or bake. Feel your anger burn like the heat of the stove. Yet watch how vegetables soften in the heat. See how sizzling meat resists the hot pan, then relaxes to accept the transformation. Your finished meal will be a product of healing, comforting and creative, cathartic and nourishing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there's so, so many interwoven aspects there of of, of working with the, like the raw materials and that almost alchemical process of yeah. transformation. That, Yes. Yeah, so yeah, and just I like reflecting. Oh, sorry. Sorry. And yeah. re reflecting on how many teachers are around us, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, grief and death are significant teachers. We don't often see them that way, but mm -hmm. you know, this is a real opportunity to get to know yourself in a different way. And then I think maybe I'll just um, there's just two more if we have time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one, the artwork um, is by William Rhodes. I don't know if you can see that. Actually, it's an, uh, just a fantastically complex portrait painting. It was done with gold leaf, um, which you can see a little bit better uh, when you're in person with it. And this, again, this prompt was from the National Hospice Co Cooperative, but it's, uh, who am I now? A difficult life change or the loss of an important person in our lives often affects our self-definition. 
Roles may change. You may question who you are now. Focusing on the parts of your character that have not changed may help you see that only your role has changed. The essence of who you are is still very present. And this, I, I just feel like, is so important because, as we know, families, communities, I mean, it's just wild the way that the dynamics can shift so powerfully, you know, around a death. And um, again, after my parents died, you know, just understanding, oh, I need to step into this different role. Or, you know, of course, if a child dies, well, am I a parent anymore? I mean, these changes are they're profound, they're destabilizing. And so just, you know, really having that understanding that that's not unique to you, that it's a process that people go through and that this anchor of who you are is, you know, still really there. And I think the last one I'm going to go with um, is this uh, prompt and artwork by Andrew Bink um, uh, Binkley. And it's just a picture of a cloud. And the prompt says, instructions for becoming a cloud. Lie back and rest on the razor's edge of earth and sky. Look up to the clouds. Now, let go. Quite beautiful. There's such a such a variation in the deck of these kind of vast lyrical invitations that are quite brief but invite you know some expansion and then maybe contrasting that with the the one you shared of food and cooking that seems much more kind of gro grounded and almost instructional gently instructional to kind of give focus if people are feeling maybe too lost or or too, um, you know, without anchor, as you said. So, yeah, yeah, there's a real, I mean, there's so many that are art practices that people share that are processual. They're not about making something look good. Mm -hmm. They can help you stop thinking or help remember someone or help, you know, there's ones about music, of course, um, and uh, also about connecting with your ancestors. Those are just a few. Um, and many that offer different types of rituals or, or suggestions, you know, of course, to be in nature, a real um, healing partner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You mentioned before, so there's a few threads circling for me. You mentioned before about death and grief as, as teachers and also of these different practices which signal ways in which humans have found ways to support each other or seek support from the more than human world in times that were difficult. I've heard you talk about this in relation to your own practice as well, kind of looking how have, how have people responded in challenging times further back in the arc of history. Mm -hmm. So very much not only connecting to ancestors, but ritual, um, community, all of these things play such an important part in how humans have grieved um, long before psychology or mental health existed, for example. You know, those things are interwoven and necessary. I'm definitely not trying to set up a dichotomy, like a, yeah. a, 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 um, an either or. But to ask you, you know, to share something more around the significance of not only this being a crowdsourced or specifically because this is a crowdsourced deck, you know, as I hold it, there's this sense of like collective wisdom, which mm. feels literally tangible mm. you know, and, and seems to connect to the very, like the image in my head is of threads woven into a much thicker, you know, kind of uh, mm. braided, uh, braided thing. Yeah. Something about collective wisdom and the, what that offers that's so different from being an individual, isolated, expected to know or find your way alone. Right. Thank you for noticing that. And, and those are all really 
really moving observations for me to hear from you reflecting back on it. Um, well, here's the thing. We've been dying for quite a while, uh, you know, as a, as a, it's part of our natural process and actually death um, and dying are intricately connected to living. Um, the food that we eat is grown in soil that is all made of dead things. Um, so we, the life is supported by death and it's only been very, very, very recently that those processes have been separated um, somehow and obscured, you know, from your view. And of course, you know, just to acknowledge that many cultures throughout the world still have active grief supporting cultures, um, mm -hmm. thankfully, because we can also learn from them. And um, mm -hmm. so this is a very, un it's, it's, it's more the anomaly what we have right now where we're not um, around the body um, before and long after, you know, the death occurs, um, that we're not really connected deeply with community um, support in all different kinds of ways. And certainly the COVID brought up this extreme of separation, you know, and maybe ma highlighted that in a while and highlighted the, the needs, but the needs were there, you know, before, before COVID for sure. And I'm happy that the grief deck has been able to serve communities, you know, well beyond, you might not even notice that it was instigated within COVID. It doesn't, there's maybe a few cards that are specific to it. But. Mm. So that, um, and, and also to say that we've been dying, that that's a natural process, it's a sacred process, and that grieving is also a natural sacred process. It's not something to be pathologized. Um, it is uh, something that many people, if you begin to really, as I do grief circles, it's, it's just surprising how many people are carrying around so much grief of all, and compounded grief and mm. historical grief, you know. Um, and it feels to me like, it, like that's part of the damage, you know, in our culture is not being able to fully really lean into that and process that because we're often so afraid that we're going to completely fall apart and there won't be anything to catch us. Mm -hmm. um, that's the fear. And so we hold in and many times people don't give themselves up, you know, to that, but there's like tremendous transformation and, um, and just, um, yeah, teachings. I just think it's so unique. Grief is one thing that's so unique to every person, but you know, there's, there's things, there's things to be for, for people to learn as uh, in community and that communities can support each other in. And um, uh, of course, um, profound uh, compounded grief um, and certainly as it intersects with mental health, um, other health, mental health challenges um, should absolutely be addressed, you know, with a health professional. But some of these other natural processes of moving through grief, we just need to make space for them. And we're out of practice as a culture. I'll speak about Western culture in particular. Mm. So that's where all the awkwardness or people not really saying the right thing or what, you know, like we're out of practice. Like, you know, we've, we, we, we gave death over to doctors and to medical situations and, you know, the, uh, that seemed like the right thing to do, you know. Um, I don't think anyone was doing it in a nefarious way. But, um, you know, what we're understanding now in very significant ways is that that uh, actually being attendant of death, if, you're, if you have the privilege of being able to do that, that that supports you in your grief um, process as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, so I... I that wasn't a precise answer, but just mm -hmm. to speak more generally about um, the ways that many times we know what we need, but we just don't have the space and reflective, like, you know, kind of context in which to really be able to listen, you know, to that. Mm -hmm. And that um, listening is a lot of what, you know, what, what this work is and also supporting other people in grief is really a lot about just listening and witnessing Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I found, and so we're ca we're all capable of doing that. Uh, some yeah. of us, you know, have 
practice that more than others, uh, you know. But um, yeah, we're all we're all capable of doing that. Yeah, and and I I really like that link to the fact that you frame the deck as a toolkit, you know, with this practicality. So in the sense of echoing what you said about in Western culture, typically we're out of practice, you know, so we can mm -hmm. feel as though we've never known how to do this. But I think if we look, right. if we look back, there are ways we must have known how to, otherwise right. the lineage of that led to anyone, anyone who's listening to this being breathing and heart beating in the world um, would be different. Um, and this idea of finding finding echoes or finding listening out for something that you might sense inside but need the resonant echo of an image or a song or you know allowing it's like listening with space maybe or something like that to mm -hmm. to encounter a shift in your own perspective so i know for many people using things like decks or or tarot in mm. say therapeutic settings that that is less it's less about or often not linked to any divinatory <laughs> um, practice per se but can be also used in a way that you you simply seek to gently interrupt the regular flow of the story Absolutely. i tell about this situation in my life Absolutely. and kind of invite oh how would it be to to explore this thing from this angle or from this aspect mm. of consideration Absolutely, definitely. I, I I feel like that's a big part of what the, um, especially all the different voices that are in the deck uh, mm. is about. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. Um, Adrian, thank you so much for your time and your your reflections on the deck. I, I wanted to see was there anything else you wanted to to let people know or or to to share. Yeah, I think the one thing just to mention again that it's an open repository. It's a toolkit that's completely free. It's just at um, griefdeck.com. And then also what something that emerged um, while we were doing, uh, what, once we launched the original um, Grief Deck was that people said, oh, this is great, but I need, it to, I need some tools to work with young people who, and children who are grieving. And so we did another deck. Uh, that is the children and youth artist um, grief deck. Mm -hmm. And that is a separate tab on the website. Um, and again, it's artwork and prompts. And with that one, we thought we were gonna have to get experts, you know, who worked with young people to be able to do most of the prompts. We ended up getting just unbelievable prompts from young people and, and children as young as six, you know, um, who who sent things in. And we had we worked uh, partnered with the National Hospice Coalition again um, with the art therapist there talking about it's color coded for age um, appropriate development as well. And so, again, I just just wanted to point that, that out as a resource. Um, yeah. Uh, to your uh, audience as well, and and um, just also just send my um, just all my blessings and greatest hope for you to find um, what you need as you're moving through grief, as you're supporting people with grief. Um, mm. Yeah, mm. thank you for doing what you do. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's, and I echo that back in your direction. Thank you. Thank you so much for also highlighting that that youth deck, and we'll definitely link to to both um, in the in the show notes as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much, and and certainly do encourage people if you're listening and and um, yeah, feel feel moved to the idea of this open repository of invitations for contribution for sharing, and um, there's something about that having this this. Um, invitation to break the isolation that's so often common in contemporary society people being asked to grieve alone this is like a, mm -hmm. a gentle gesture to contribute to a, a much to be a tributary to a, to the the ocean yeah mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you